We've got someone over here. I think he's alive. The cracking of rubble sounded above, and exhausted breathing strained as they slowly moved the bits of earth and brick. The man opened his eyes, the same lack of vision surrounding him as he was experiencing previously. But then as another strained groan pierced through the rubble, a small sliver of light was projected across his face, the glare unbearable, as his eyes adjusted to the new incoming light. Another piece was removed, and the entirety of the man's face was enveloped in light, and the nature of the sky was revealed to him. He blinked, and the red streaked remnants of the clouds drifted in and out of the ash-filled atmosphere, and then a dark object took the place of the sky, covering his vision. Slowly, a pair of eyes became visible through the visor, and they looked young. Out of place even. Lieutenant. The man's visor pulsed to life as he placed his helmet back upon his head. A set of green print appeared before him in the center of his field of vision. Directive 1. Hold position at all costs until evacuation is complete. Directive 2. The man stared blankly at the second line, expecting a second set of instructions to appear. Nothing did. The lieutenant pushed himself from the wall, shaking his head quickly, before attempting to regain what was left of his composure. He stared at the group gathered around him, a group of equally scared if not terrified men. Him keeping it together was all that mattered to the group anymore. The dim lit room was cut apart by the bright visors, and displays spread before the view of everyone. The lieutenant released another held breath, looking to the group. We're shafted. We hold the avenue until everyone's out or we're all dead. It's up to you all which one comes first. The group as a whole seemed indifferent, but he had seen the reactions before. The new inductees into the operation team seemed disturbed beyond belief, unable to hold it together. The lieutenant offhandedly thought about their ages. The majority of them looked fresh out of high school, if not drafted even younger. Take positions on the floors of this building. Alternate one team every other floor. Don't get bunched up, shoot straight, and, well, you know the rest. The lieutenant himself often thought himself undeserving to be in a command position. He had no tactical experience, hunted for sport, and had never killed a man or any civilized creature. Things had changed however, and all that mattered was that you could shoot straight and could follow orders. The group shuffled away from him, a few of the recruits whispering nervously in between themselves in small groups, as they either went up or down a few flights of stairs. The lieutenant stood alone on the fourth floor after they had all left. He let another pent-up breath from his lungs, moving over to the windowsill and leaning his weapon against the window. He slid down, his back to it when he stared idly to the wall opposite of him. The crunching of metal grew closer, and so did the shaking of the earth. The destroyed bits of the city block were removed around from him. And as he was lifted from his temporary coffin, he slowly took in the visuals that surrounded him. It seemed he had only moved into a larger one. The entirety of the street seemed half collapsed or close to doing so. Bodies littered the street. Red and green blood, the black oil and the stingy smell of burned flesh and decomposing corpses. The box had only gotten larger. And as he felt two men under his arms, his head hung loosely, his gaze still focused on this himself. His armor was cut up, the pant legs underneath the plating completely torn or burned. His chest plate and vest was covered in scratches and dirt and blood, but the insignias and ribbons that decorated his shoulders and front seemed brighter and more impeccably shined than ever as he was dragged half-consciously through the street. The lieutenant clutched his weapon close to his chest, keeping out of sight from the window as the crunching grew louder and louder. The smashing of walls and screeching of screams could be heard, as the mechanical beasts moved closer, their metal feet on the asphalt like nails on a chalkboard. Then they stopped. 
the hydraulics could be heard whirring, not too far from the building. They've seen us. They've seen the cannons fired and the shells impacted two floor above. The man's yells for help were silenced by a gurgle and a scream. The hydraulics on the machine could be heard moving again. The lieutenant began to take a series of pained breaths before loading a small projectile into the front of the chamber of his weapon, a small nose cone poking from the front of the barrel. He turned around, pushing himself away from the window with his legs, before jumping to his feet with his launcher over his shoulder, finger on the trigger. He fired. They fired. The man saw the ground under him begin to slowly clear, but his vision was slowly fading. He felt the blood in his veins slowing down, the pulses inside of him beginning to take longer breaks, between one another. His posture sunk more, his legs now dragging across the ground from the knees down. A muffled panicked voice could be heard, but it sounded miles away, hidden behind walls of brick. A low whine, a plea. A few more raspy breaths went through the lieutenant system. He shuddered at his core, his vision turning to a fogged window, and from a fogged window into a fading light. The ground beneath him changed from grey to white, and then to red. The lieutenant sputtered forth a mouthful of blood, before feeling himself fall away, a final word pulsing through his mind. Relief. The suited man approached the dull tombstone in the field covered by so many more. He went down onto a knee, leaning forward to read the inscription on the stone. Lieutenant M. H. Royce. Jan 24, 2640 to May 2, 2690. Mercury 51, 817th Defensive Corps. Battle of Dallas. Third, Intrasolar War. He laid a small envelope at its base, stood up, and walked away. Author's name and the link to original text is in the description.